Welcome to Insight Talks, brought to you by Outlook in association with Johnson Tiles. This is a conversation series with architects and designers. It's not typically about their landmark projects or awards they won. It's about them as a person, as a creator, a master and a learner. The interviews are taken by filmmaker Aradhana Seth in very informal and free-flowing style. And let me tell you, every conversation has very interesting and inspiring stories. Hello and Namaste. I am Dinesh Vyas and I welcome you to the Insight Talks brought to you by Outlook in association with Prism Johnson. In this episode, Aradhana Seth is in conversation with Delhi-based celebrated and I think one of the most beautiful designers Sonali Bhagwati. Driven by passion, Sonali Bhagwati, the president of DPA, is an alumnus of prestigious institute SEPT Ahmedabad. She told some very interesting stories that include how did she reach Ahmedabad. Known as a virtuoso in the industry, she has won numerous awards and accolades. She also talked about his favorite subject, setting right the city of Delhi. I really find her too good when it comes to communicating even a complex thing in a simple yet impressive way. So let's join her in the conversation with Aradhana Se. What inspired you to go into architecture, Sunali? You know, ever since I was quite young, maybe 10 or 11 or 12, I used to enjoy art. In fact, I used to go to Triveni and do art classes. And during that period, I interacted a lot with the senior artists who were there. So somehow I got very heavily influenced by art. Not that I understood much of it, but I think it just remains in your subconscious. And then when I finished school, um, I knew what I didn't want to do, which was academics, you know, pure academics. However, I needed to do physics, chem and math because that was the criteria that one had to have in order to apply for architecture. So honestly, I didn't think of doing anything but architecture. And I went and applied at the Baroda School of Architecture. And uh, when I did the entrance exam, it was all physics, chem and math. And I said, oh my God, this is my nemesis. I'm finished and I was sort of depressed I didn't know what to do and then I said okay we are very close to Ahmedabad so me and this girlfriend of mine we got into a bus and we went to Ahmedabad we walked into Sept and as a 17 year old when I walked into Sept I said wow this is the best place I have ever been to and not only do I want to study architecture, I want to study architecture right here. And that's when I said, okay, that's it. It's architecture and nothing else, you know. In fact, my parents tried to persuade me a lot to come to Delhi thereafter. Uh, but by that time, I was very happy to be at SEPT and I just continued and did my five years. In fact, I come from an extremely emancipated Gujarati family uh, which is full of overachievers and very very highly academic so going into architecture was bad enough but not only that going to set in Ahmedabad which was unconventional bordering on hippie culture was completely out of sync with my family but much to the credit of my parents, I have to admit that they were most supportive. Not once did they ever, ever even say, not only would they dissuade me, but they were actually encouraging because they felt that whatever you choose for yourself, you need to excel in it. You put in your complete focus and you put in your full effort and make sure that you are best at it. So that was really their attitude. And did you immediately set up your own practice or did you work with somebody to start with? 
you know um, while i was doing my thesis uh, it was a bit of a adventurous period because uh, i was wanting to do my thesis in a particular strain of urban design however i it was not coming together i was struggling with formulating my approach and formatting my thesis but i was not quite happy with it so by default i would say i st- i met somebody who was into jewelry and he encouraged me to look at jewelry design and that's when i would say it defines that architecture is the mother of all arts and jewelry design is very much a part of art you know so i actually got into jewelry design it was semi precious and uh, costume jewelry it was really fun and things that i made with my hands we i experimented with different stones and different metals and all sorts of things and then i even exported a bit of it and uh it was this fun one year i went through at the end of that one year i said oh my god i am supposed to be an architect so i packed it all up put it away but with a extremely refreshed mind very very rejuvenated i got back into my thesis and somehow everything started falling into place you know and then of course i met uh, this lady who became my thesis guide eventually this architect rosemary suchdev unfortunately she is no more and together with her i sort of started formulating my way forward and following my thesis i actually conducted heritage walks in kashmiri gate area for 10 years thereafter so it was a wonderful sort of a way forward that i had and and what was can you tell us a little bit more about your thesis uh i decided to take up kashmiri gate area and then i did not a stylistic study but an anthropometric study of how that area evolved over a period of 180 years so i took up this area from its pre pre uh, british uh time to the time when the british came in the 1803 war with the marathas uh the british coming in then the mutiny uh post mutiny uh and then you know forming of uh, uh the civil lines uh and all the way up to 1983 84 85 you know so it was like a period of 180 years and how the area has evolved what are the factors that make urban changes uh how does technology come into picture you know and uh what are the constants and how the institutions of a society govern its urban form so it was a very very anthropometric uh socio cultural kind of a approach to urban design but talking about technology how do you marry technology and architecture uh when i first started practice uh there was practically no technology we were had these large drawing boards and parallels and we drew with pens and pencils but immediately after we bought our first system by taking a bank loan of 5 lakhs and we had this big computer set up you know and we had to get a person who could operate it because we were not Uh, computer literate i would say by early 90s uh, the entire office had gone on to uh, autocad and we were doing all our projects and of course our criteria for taking in people started changing because uh, their computer skills and what kind of softwares they work with became extremely important i think that's great but i think i still come from the little bit of an old school where i love drawing and i love thinking and i love doodling even if it's on a ipad not only in the office i would say technology has a great part to play even in actually uh, putting up of a project you know whether it's an interior it's architecture it's at whatever level so today 
uh, architecture is no longer a mom and pop profession okay like when we started architect was like the main whole and soul okay today architect is still a whole and soul but more as a visionary the architect is a conductor he has the orchestra which has various people and various services and the architect needs to bring them together and make sure that each one plays their part in order to make sure that the entire vision as is there with the architect is realized whether it's material or whether it's manpower you know when you get a project or say where do you you start with the vision and then how do you go back and forth and also how do you keep abreast with new technology uh you know there are a couple of things the way i work uh one is that i love being around the younger people because they keep me young i love learning from them i love to see what they're doing because they've got their fingers into so many things and i think i need to learn that from them so i constantly want to be around young people you know i need the freshness so that is the primary thing as far as i'm concerned as a person at a personal level uh at a professional level i feel that uh i we always invite anyone who is coming up with new systems new materials um you know whatever else is there in the market so we always welcome the industry partners to come in and apprise us of what is happening what is coming in what can be done how can it be applied uh we work very closely suppose today i'm looking at glass just for example you know um i will call in people from two or three glass companies and tell me educate me what can your product do um uh, what can i do this can i do that so we work in a very integral manner with various people in the industry because i need i have as much to learn from them as they would want me to use their product you know uh so it's a learning curve for me besides that of course um i make sure that we go to fairs we travel uh and there is a great deal of learning for me and my husband who's also my partner i think the kind of connects you made kind of things you see what is there in the market the different design styles which are emerging the color palettes at a different level uh the different technologies which are coming in uh there is a huge amount of technology integration into our projects now um i would say a skillful integration of services and technology into architecture and interior is like a almost like is at the core of good design and if you looked at green architecture in a particular way i'm not saying even a lead architect but just how do you look at that i'll give you an example i would say today green and sustainability are a very talked about words okay however i feel that it's not just something that you impose on any building or architecture it needs to be integral to your thought process I feel personally that we are brought up with sustainability reuse recycle at the core of our thought process because we are used to not wasting we are used to recycling uh we are used to reusing um these are things i mean as a child i don't know if you ever remember there used to be women who used to come with utensils and they took old clothes and gave you utensils the vagri you know? community so there was this whole there was always these systems the rag pickers mm. so i'm just saying that these systems have always been at the core of our working if you see our vernacular architecture mm. it was probably the most sustainable Supreme. and that is where our learnings need to come from mm. you know everything i would say out of the 70 80 points of our certifications that you talk about maybe 50 
were already there in your vernacular architecture you know they just took care of these things mm-hmm. i'll give you a small example we did a project for uh, a, syst- a a company called adobe systems okay uh, when they were doing their first headquarters we did that for them and um, i would say more as just good design practices we took certain design calls you know when there was a south side we had this sort of a pretty a solid facade with smaller punched windows we had more of the glass on the north mm. side and uh, even in terms of your other uh, engineering systems the way we looked at them and the way they got designed and um, that building came out it was working very well 10 years later they decided to apply for a certification they did not even inform us they went in and applied for certification and they were almost eligible for a platinum so i'm just saying that it's just logical thinking mm-hmm. and good design practices and good engineering practices which form the core of your thought process can lead to creating environments mm-hmm. which are sustainable and which um, are not ravaging i mean every development is ravaging but i would say which alleviates mm. the level of ravaging a mother earth mm. so i think that's what but what i would like to add in the same breath today is that we as architects always look at our own projects whether it's a mixed use development or it is uh, you know any housing or anything we can make it very sustainable we do all our reuse and we do recycling and everything we can do all our 10 15 points which we should be doing however this is one island of sustainability there is another island of sustainability which is another development there may be another island what happens to all the public areas mm. which are in between which are the public realm so your private realm is all designed well worked out well configured and sustainable but your public realm the no man's land is nowhere and that's the major part of our area in any urban or any city today your developed areas are 30% 70% is your public realm and where are we on our public realm neither sustainability nor design mm. so i think that is where we need to concentrate on our comfortable private domains will always be there but let's step out and let's uh, address our public domain let's bring back the pedestrian because today we are all using cars why can't we be walking why can't we be doing mass transit so these are the kind of approaches we can only walk if the place is designed to walk yes you know so i'm saying that eventually good design can also influence social behavior and that's what i would say should be the next step into uh, bringing sustainability into the public realm it's a little controversial but unless the authorities take a hard call i mean you cannot make everyone happy so you have to take a hard call and decide what's right and i feel that if you do one pilot project and prove that it's successful the rest will follow i had the privilege of being part of a design group which was looking at re-pedestrianizing cannot place and we looked at trying to create the inner circle <clears throat> and part of the outer uh, the middle circle as pedestrian so it was a very comprehensive plan uh, you cannot wish the cars away you have to see how they go where they go where will they park how will the people come in and it was quite comprehensive you know at a concept level but we were told that the traders will never agree I said you know today somebody pays a lot of money to be in a mall because you want an external environment outside your shop 
this is giving you an external environment for free. Why would you not want it? But because they feel that they're going to lose foot, uh, footfalls, you know, coming in, and which is a very narrow vision. So if you take a hard call and prove that this is actually going to create an environment where your footfalls are going to increase, then they will agree to it. But you need to be able to take those hard calls and put in the effort to actually convince them and prove to them with facts and figures and take them on board. So this is where I come from. And can you tell us a little bit about finishing materials that you work with? In terms of building materials, when you talk about structure and you talk about finishing, um, I think steel is a very, very interesting material. And unfortunately, till now, or I would say till a little while ago, uh, steel was actually a very expensive material in India. Uh, and people did not use it that much because also steel gives you very fast construction. Uh, and somehow uh, that aspect was not fully utilized. But I always felt that steel was a, a wonderful material. Like if you go back to um, like uh, early 1900s, there was this whole, uh, you know, transition from uh, in terms of structure from very thick load bearing materials, uh, which was in, in Europe I'm talking about, to the advent of steel as a building material. And if you see even today in Old Delhi, you can see that you have this beautiful cast uh, metal columns with those little pedestals on top and little filigree going through. So that shows that how those, you know, steel sort of made those thick uh, load-bearing structures become really slim, it made the high-rise come up. Uh, so there was a huge transformation that steel brought in our building industry. And I felt that somehow in India we had not capitalized on it. We were still too much ingrained with the conventional uh, beam column RCC structures. But I think today in terms of construction also, there is a huge change that is happening in terms of, uh, even in RCC, um, you know, lots of uh, prefab work is going on. There's a lot of post-tension work is going on. So there are things which are moving, which is really definitely helping uh, even create larger spans and different types of, uh, you know, spaces. When it comes to finishing materials and when it comes to interior, uh, things have changed dramatically. There's been a quantum shift, you know. When I started practicing in the late 80s, uh, everything was, you know, everything that you saw somewhere else as, oh, that's really nice, but we can't do it because we don't have the resources. Come 90s and that went away. And over those three, four, five years, when the economy opened up, we suddenly started getting access and the world started becoming smaller and the hopes and aspirations of people changed and then suddenly you were doing things that you never perceived of doing earlier you know and things started the the difference between what was elsewhere and what was in india started becoming smaller of course with this also came some really ugly and unthought out things but i would say now that's something which you can never avoid you know i mean people have to be sensitized uh, that you cannot just slap on anything anywhere but putting that aside i would say that uh, our access to materials today is as much as anywhere else in the world let's say uh, early 90s came a very uh, material that was very prominent and very sort of used for a long time which is alucobond which was a composite aluminum panel this was like a direct import from everywhere else okay and people were saying oh wow like you know this aluminum panels and this and that so for a few years it went sort of everything even in old delhi in buildings which are right opposite uh, jama masjid you had alucobond going on anywhere any place you know and then 
fortunately people realize that this is not on and now people have going back to more natural materials use metal but use pure metals use uh, you know stone use uh, you know plasters textures you know so fortunately a lot of these plastic materials are now taking a back seat uh, at least i would say in a lot of developments and um, of course today we call a, you talk about glass now glass is not just glass glass is like a like a big story a lesson in glass can take you 3 days to learn you know um make sure that you use things in the correct way and to get the correct end result whether it is aesthetically technologically or in a sustainable manner so you want to talk a little bit about ceramic uh ceramic is actually a wonderful material and i love it uh i would say going back in the late 80s was the first time that i had used uh ceramic tiles and i think the first company that made ceramic tiles in india i had used them and then of course the industry has grown by leaps and bounds and today we have probably much better selection of ceramic products than anywhere else in the world i mean between those four or five companies which are operating in india and mori being the ceramic capital of india uh has larger players smaller players designs i mean sky's the limit of what comes out of morvi you know and it's a matter of great pride what we've done in the ceramic industry so today i mean honestly we do not even need to use stone if we don't want to but use stone where your design requires use tiles where that requires you know because today i wouldn't say that okay tiles are cheaper than stone but it is not for the cost part of it but it's from the design perspective what the tile offers you have large format tiles you have um, you know textured tiles you have um, glass tiles you have all sorts of things you know uh you have uh, you know handmade you have vibrant colors you have you use tiles for what it has to offer not because you are replacing it for something else you know and it's it's a wonderful material if you were to talk to young architects if you were starting your practice today what advice would you give them or if you were them today today there is a big race among the younger generation to go forward you know everyone wants to outdo the other in terms of uh, you know i've done this i've done that and to post on insta this but i think in that race sometimes you forget that there are certain processes and certain steps that need to be followed when you get into architecture when you get into any form of design you need to be able to go through the steps in order to come out with a mature design you cannot dream up you know it's not a dream that becomes a design that dream is 1% you need to work 99% to make that 1% happen learn to make sure that you follow the steps and come out with architecture interior whatever you may be doing which is worth its salt which stands the test of time which is well detailed and something that looking back 20 years later you need to be proud of have conviction in yourself and make sure that you work at something do not lose focus and as i said most importantly architecture is 99% hard work like any other profession you need to have that clear picture yourself and it takes a little bit of time to develop that to internalize before you give that to someone else and how does it work in your partnership with your husband i mean do you have different rules or do you kind of discuss everything or do you bifurcate some part of the work i met sarab when i was 17 years old married him 10 years later but we were working for 3 4 years before we got married 
So we had a very clear professional relationship. And that relationship was very well defined. You know, we were always two parallel verticals. And whatever he did, he did. Whatever I did, I did. And I could always brainstorm, be, be brainstormed with each other. But it was my choice to do what I thought was right and it was his choice to do what he thought was right. And we have always respected each other, given each other that space. Do you feel that things have changed post-pandemic? I think uh, hygiene is a key word mm. and I'm so glad that there is a lot more sensitivity to hygiene in every way, you know. Uh, in terms of the kind of surfaces that you use, uh, how to, you know, how the cleanability of those mm. surfaces. Uh, wellness has been the new mantra, I would say. And now, of course, there are wellness consultants who will yes. sort of get you the wellness mm -hmm. certification, mm -hmm. you know. But I think wellness, like green, needs to be intrinsic. Mm. Uh, it needs to, uh, like for example, today, uh, what has happened is that uh, we never thought of work from home. Flexibility of letting somebody work partly from home, partly from office, is a concept that never was there earlier. I still remember my partner. He used to rush out to the office by 8.30, 8.45 in the morning, you know, and he would be at work by 9 o'clock, blah, blah, blah. Today, he has his desk set up in my room, which he has usurped. And uh, uh, he actually starts work sometimes by 6.30 in the morning because he's sending some mails off. Then he goes down to the gym or he walks, he comes back. I'm sitting, I come back from my gym, I'm sitting and finishing up some calls uh, while I change, get dressed, and then I go off to office. So now today, that transition from work to home has become seamless. So this was never sort of even conceived earlier. Mm. What are your other influences to architecture other than jewellery and art? I would say my other influence is not so much to architecture as it is to urban design and my passion for re-pedestrianizing my city, what I call fixing my city. So if given an opportunity where I didn't have to earn a living, I would dedicate my life to fixing my city and bring the pedestrian back. As a child, I used to cycle to school, I cycled to my friend's place, I cycled to the market. These were small things, you know, and we never used the car. And today, um, I, I am myself scared. I have a cycle that I bought, which I intend to use to go to my office. I want to start by me doing the first bit of cycling before I can ask anyone else to do it. I believe in mass transit. I believe in using the metro myself, reducing the use of cars. So these are my influences because I want to prove to myself it's doable. If I can do it, anyone else can do it. And these are the ways where I feel I want to channelize my energy which is more on a community level, more at a city level, more at an urban level. And I mean, when Metro started, I think that's the best thing that has happened to our city. It should have been done 30 years ago. 30 years ago, but better late than never. Yeah. And uh, the funny part is, I would say almost 20 years ago, when I first took the Metro, the red line, from Central Secretariat to Kashmiri Gate, because I was going to Palna with my kids and um, I got off at Kashmiri Gate and I said, oh, Kashmiri Gate, I know it's like the back of my hand. I've walked in this, in this part of town for like months and months, you know. So like I know every nook and corner of this place. But the urban change that came about with the advent of the metro and the metro station was so drastic that when I came out due to lack of proper signage at that time, 
I didn't know where I was. I didn't know whether I needed to go to left or right in order to get to Palna, to Kutsia Bagh, you know. And I actually asked a rickshaw that, where is Kutsia Bagh? And I felt so, I said, oh my God, I am disoriented. Uh, so, you know, things like metro and technology like this can cause quantum shifts in urban form. Another quantum shift that got formed, I'm sorry, I'm going a little out of, uh, uh, is that when uh, old Delhi, Shah Jahanabad, had three major events that changed its urban form. First was the Darbar. And with the Darbar came the big Lothian Road, you know, which is the road that comes in from Darya Ganj and comes out at Kashmiri Gate, which uh, has the red fort on one side. When that road was made, it created a full thoroughfare through the old city and it, it actually changed the urban dynamics of the city. The second thing that happened was uh, the uh, railways coming in. So a huge chunk of um, uh, you know, city was demolished to bring in the railway lines and the third was uh, another set of roads that were created at the periphery to actually connect the city. So these kind of urban, you know, this was technology also coming in, you know, roads, railways and electricity then came in, you know. So that actually changed the complete urban dynamics because from a purely residential area, it started becoming highly commercial and the railways brought in the warehousing. So the entire dynamics of the old city changed. So that's how, you know, few events, whether it's historical or technological, can make huge impact on urban form. So if given an opportunity where I didn't have to earn a living, I would dedicate my life to fixing my city mm. and bring the pedestrian back. Thank you, Sonali. That was My wonderful. Pleasure. These inside talks will acquaint you with the architect's professional approach, values that they respect and expect, their philosophy, and above all, how they look at life, other people, and this very planet. Let us join the respected professional at Inside Story. And just to add, Prism Johnson is engaged with the fraternity of designers in multiple ways, which includes publication of reputed journal Insight. You can also receive very rich and professional content by subscribing to the newsletter from InsightReview.in. Thank you very much.